Jeremy Corbyn is lying about the NHS to get votes, and he thinks that you are too stupid to realise. I have got more faith in the integrity and intellect of the British nation. That is this week's talking point, and joining me to discuss it is political strategist Alex Dean. Alex, okay. free trade is the biggest advantage of Brexit, and the NHS isn't going to die as a result, is it? Well, thanks for having me, and congratulations on the show. Um, I definitely believe that free trade is the single most significant economic advantage about Brexit. I've got a lot of concerns about sovereignty and our ability mm -hmm. to govern ourselves, and that was my first real governing principle in campaigning for Brexit. But you're right, in economic terms, in my view, our ability to negotiate trade deals around the world is by miles the most significant uh, aspect of our departure from the EU. There are people who wanted to prioritise our ability to control immigration, yes. and they were part of the coalition uh, that campaigned to leave the EU, but that really wasn't what motivated me. For me, it was free trade, and it remains free trade. Look at it like this. Britain, when we became a member of the EU, significantly diminished our ability to trade around the world. If you're an EU accession member from the East, used to the jackboot of the Soviets, and then you uh, ha have had the time after the fall of the Soviet Union, scrabbling for your place in the world, no wonder membership of the EU looks like an expansion of your, your horizon. It is a significant expansion of your markets. But for the UK, a global trading nation, accustomed to trading around the world, we actually shut down our ability to trade with countries with whom we have very long trading links when we joined and when we've chosen to remain in. So for me, our ability to trade is the vital point. But I'll go one more. Everyone thinks it's about goods, as you were talking about in your introduction. But actually, it's not just goods. Britain is the world's leading provider of services. And here in London, we're the world's best hub of services. Not only can, do I note that the EU has failed always to complete the single market in services, so actually free trade in services in the EU isn't yet complete, mm -hmm. but they've yet to, com yet to put services in any free trade agreement with anyone in, around the world when the EU does a trade uh, deal. Let's f imagine we'd voted to stay in the EU. Do you think then the EU would have said, well, now the Brits have decided to remain. Now for the first time we'll prioritise what the Brits are best at. I don't. I think we're only going to prioritise services and free trade in services if we can control our own trade deals, and that's what we get by leaving the EU. There was some discussion, and I should say that you advise some of the most important corporations in the world on how to deal with governments and how to deal with regulation. Um, but there was significant concern that if we weren't at the top table in Brussels, then we might be pushed around by the EU in terms of access to markets and regulation. Is that a concern you share? No, not, not one bit. I mean, we are a t world's top five uh, significant nation in military power, in soft power and diplomacy, and certainly in economic activity. We're going to be an outsized third party nation um, just outside the European Union, trading closely with them. It would be crazy for the EU to seek not to involve our voice. And you will note that even in the hardest times of our discussions with the EU, and I concede, of course, it hasn't all been plain sailing since we voted to leave, but in the hardest times, the EU still wanted to ensure that they had access to the City of London, to finance done through the city, and to what you can find in debt. Because what we're talking about in most of the Euro nations now are debt fueled economies mm -hmm. and debt riven environments in which they desperately need access to that kind of debt. That may, that, that may sound like it, it's uh, manipulating them somehow or, or pushing them. It's not. It's simply pointing out the fact that they need to have continued access to the City of London. And that's a significant aspect of our control or ability to control our economy, but also to influence economies outside the UK. In my introduction, I talked about the link between Brexit and the NHS. In yeah. truth, I do not believe there is a link between Brexit and the NHS. And yet, yeah. suddenly, throughout this debate, which should be about free trade, about sovereignty, about cutting food prices for British people, and, of course, buying that produce from developing nations, the NHS has become so involved in this. Why has yeah. that happened? There is a link that we should be aware of, which is about people on low pay working in the NHS, who we might not have access to if we had stringent immigration controls in the UK. It's one of the reasons I don't want us to become a more rigid country on immigration terms. I want right. us to have a more liberal uh, migration approach. But putting that to one side, all the discussions about trade and, and Brexit, it has nothing to do with the NHS. It's absolutely extraordinary to try to manipulate uh, the NHS 
and make it a talking point in, in Brexit. I actually think it's just the same as the left has always said, you know, 48 hours to save the NHS, mm. 24 hours to save the NHS before every single election we've had. Lo and behold, Tories win. NHS is still there and thriving five years later. So it's just a knee-jerk response uh, from the left. Yeah. And, and, and does, uh, does this prove they're losing the argument? Well, no, because it's, it still works. <laughs> it's, okay. a, it's a dog whistle that works to their audience. And in modern elections aren't like this. They're not, they're not actually combat between two sides going at each other. Modern elections are tram lines where the two parties stick to their own positions and seek to draw out their own electorates. That's what Corbyn and co are doing when they're talking about the NHS. They're not actually seeking to engage meaningfully in the battle of ideas. Yeah. They're seeking to motivate their supporters to come out. And if you look at it from that perspective, it actually works, even though it's not true. And it's repeatedly demonstrated that it's false after the election and the NHS is still there. One more point. GPs are private practitioners. GPs are in the private sector. And GPs are amongst the most trusted people in our whole country. Poll after poll so that your general practitioner are amongst the people you respect the most and trust the most. And yet, on Corbyn's logic about nationalisation and not allowing privatisation into the NHS, he wouldn't have GPs as they are. He'd have to nationalise them. Well, of course, the other point to make is when they talk about privatisation and we should have people rather than profit, Nuffield and Booper, the two other big providers, neither of those are for-profit companies. So actually sure. the stupidity related to this. But here's my concern. Look, you've advised the Conservative Party. You worked for David Cameron. In um, opposition. In opposition. What, what would be your advice to the Conservatives now? Because they need to take on those those northern seats. Obviously, the Brexit Party has been significantly helpful in the yeah. 317 seats. And I think I said in, in the show previously that Nigel Farage deserves credit for that. But obviously, you know, these things like the NHS are going to be a big scare to many voters that are considering voting Conservative for the first time. If you were in CCHQ, if you were the Conservative Party chairman, what would you be doing now to lock up those votes? Oh, I think the Conservative Party is doing the right thing. Matt Hancock is a credible spokesman for the, the health sector and is talking constantly about the importance of the NHS. And, it's, and the Conservative Party's commitment to it. You, there are some people who are simply never going to believe you. There are some people who are always going to be the antis. And you mustn't let those people steal too much of your time in a campaign where you're trying to drive out your vote. But you do have to assuage concerns and to demonstrate to people that listen to that Labour line and think, is that true, that it's not? And that basically seems to me is Matt Hancock's full-time job, <laughs> is, is debunking lies and myths about the NHS and saying how much the Conservative Party is committed to it. So I think they're doing the right thing. Do you think that a lot of this stuff, when you talk about, you know, the Tories are secretly going to abolish the NHS, and once again, I mentioned the Brexit Party, they've said this of Nigel Farage, his secret plan to abolish the NHS as well. Do you think that that contributes to hatred in politics? Because it seems to me that these students wouldn't be throwing eggs at people if they didn't believe the NHS was secretly up for sale. Yeah, I think we've got the tone wrong in politics, and I think a lot of that does come from the kind of uh, rhetoric y you're describing. But actually, I think Brexit has had a strange effect on, um, on polarising our, our country uh, now too. And I say that as someone who's a fervent Brexiteer. I think it's a subject on which reasonable people can reasonably disagree. The, su the sadness for me is that there's no loser's acceptance. There's no loser's legitimacy now. People won't accept that we voted to leave the EU because they, they just think it's so wrong or they think they are so much smarter than the rest of us that they want to override the will of our, the majority of people who voted in our country. And that, of course, does lead to anger. So there's anger on both sides of politics, and we shouldn't dismiss that. The difference for me is that there's legitimacy in the anger of those people who voted in 2016, uh, voted to leave the EU, and have seen their will systematically opposed by a coterie of former prime ministers, uh, wealthy uh, city business people who prefer the status quo, and celebrities who think because they they are so important. I think they know so much better than the rest of us that they can demand a so-called people's vote and try and change what happened and try and get their way anyway whilst still pretending to believe in democracy, which plainly they don't. Alex Dean, thank you. Well, there it is. Alex Dean, former political strategist, 